They can easily destroy worlds and have the power to turn back time. These are the most powerful gods in solo leveling. To understand their powers, let me first explain who was the absolute being. In another world, there was only light and darkness. Then came this dude, all covered in silver and gold, pointy and super shiny. He was known as the absolute being, and he was so overpowered that he split the light to create the messengers of God and darkness to create the monarchs. The monarchs were born to destroy the world, and the messengers were born to protect it. So basically the monarchs are like troubled children, and the messengers are like the well-behaved kids? It's not really like that. The messengers and monarchs fought each other for a very long time, but nobody could truly stand victorious. So the messengers grew tired of this endless war and asked their creator, the absolute being, to help them defeat the monarchs once and for all. But you know, this absolute being just curved him hard. So basically he didn't say anything. That's when the messengers realized that their creator liked watching them fight and didn't want the war to stop. Of course, there's nothing more entertaining than watching children fight. You know what happens when kids don't get what they want, right? They start to rebel. The messengers figured that as long as the absolute being was around, the war would never stop. In short, these kids made a plan to kill their dad. But there was one who didn't agree with this plan. One monarch named Ashborn. He was the only messenger who stayed loyal and tried to stop the others from killing their dad. But since there were so many against him, Ashborn got overwhelmed and nearly died. Right at the brink of his death, he found out that the absolute being had sneakily hidden a special power inside him. With this newfound power, he raised an army of undead soldiers and charged into battle. But by the time he got back to the absolute being, it was already too late. The other messengers had already stormed the throne room and attacked their creator. There Ashbourne found the absolute being sitting lifeless on his throne. His body pierced by countless spears, covered in blood, betrayed and murdered by his own creations. So the lesson here is guys, don't have children. But how did the rulers kill the absolute being? I mean, he's the OG God. Why would he die at the hands of his own creation? So Ashbourne explained in chapter 163, there is no such thing as infinite power. Just like how the absolute being was defeated by his creations, all power has an end. It's no different from how humans are killed or hurt by machines of their own making. You know, for example, our phones are great tools and weapons to mess up our own head. The rulers and monarchs were created to fight and they became so strong that they could even kill their own father. Just think of it like the movies about how AI could destroy humanity. So after they successfully murdered their own creator, the messengers who rebelled took over as gods and became known as the rulers. The rulers used special tools that had the power of the absolute being. With these devices, they started to attack the monarchs and even caught one of them, Lasia. Lasia is the king of the giants and the monarch of the beginning. The main issue with this character is that we haven't actually seen his full power. That's why I put him at the very end of our list because it's kind of hard to tell if he's actually the strongest or the weakest monarch. Here are two reasons why it's so confusing. Number one, he was easily captured by the rulers, which might suggest he's not that strong. Number two, the rulers went after him on purpose because he has a special kind of power that can turn the tides of a battle. This idea makes sense, especially since Ashbourne mentioned that the capture of Lasia led to a collapse in the balance of power. I also think he's quite clever, especially in how he tried to persuade Jin Wu. Let me explain. In chapter 137, when Jin Wu confronted this giant, Lei Jia was so excited because he thought he would finally be free. He promised that if Jin Wu released him, he would help him in the big war that was about to come. See? He's trying to manipulate. I think this guy would do great on Hinge. But of course, Jin Wu doesn't trust him. How can you trust a monster that is just enchained in the first place? So, to gain Jin Wu's trust, Lei Jia cast a magic spell called the Pledge of Trust. This spell made sure that neither of them could tell lies to each other. Sneaky trick, right? But of course it was actually a scam. Then Jin Wu thought that if Leija was gonna be his ally anyway, why not just turn this giant into one of his shadow soldiers? The guy is cold. At first, Leija was terrified because he thought he saw Ashborn for a second. Then he explained that Jin Wu couldn't actually turn him into a shadow soldier. This is because monarchs and rulers have astral bodies that get destroyed when they die. So Jin Wu can't turn the king of the giants into his shadow. Lei Jia still tried to convince Jin Wu to free him and become allies. But Jin Wu was way smarter than that. Jin Wu found something called an essence stone stuck in the back of Lei Jia's neck. 
That was the bad news because as long as that stone was in the giant's neck, it would make him kill humans. When Leijia realized he had been caught, he tried to attack Jinwu, but Jinwu was way too fast and dodged all his moves. Then with just one powerful hit, Jinwu ended Leijia's life. So in theory, Leijia was a major threat not just because of his strength, but also because he was really cunning. However, he wasn't so lucky with Jin Wu, who was just a little too sharp for him. Now here's what I'm thinking. Why was Leijia called the monarch of the beginning? What's up with the beginning? Was he like the very first monarch ever? Or is there something else behind it? Or what if he had some ability to mess with time? Sort of like a mini version of the Cup of Reincarnation. This cup is a powerful item that the rulers actually used to turn back time. I'm gonna explain that more later. Next up is Tarnak, the monarch of steel and king of monsters. Just like Leisha, we didn't get to see much of Tarnak's power, but judging by his title, the Monarch of Steel or the Monarch of the Iron Body, he's probably like the tank among the monarchs. He can also transform into a monster, however I think his transformation doesn't really enhance his combat power because this guy first showed up with the other three monarchs when they murdered Christopher Reed. So Tarnak teaming up with the other monarchs suggests that he's more of a tank or support rather than the main damage dealer. Then in chapter 152 when the Frost Monarch wanted the other monarchs to help him kill Jin Wu before he got too powerful, Tarnak was the first one to say Oh hell no! He thought trying to fight Jin Wu on their own was a really bad idea because Jin Wu can uh, whoop their asses. Tarnak believed it was smarter to wait for Antares, the Monarch of Destruction to come back and help them. So, if Tarnak is so strong, why wait for Antares? I'm not saying Tarnak isn't powerful, but compared to the other monarch's destructive abilities, he might not be on the same level. You know what I mean? This could be why he prefers having a teammate to handle the attacks while he focuses on defense. Fast forward. When Antares showed up in the human world, Tarnak joined him and ended up facing Thomas Andre on the battlefield. Tarnak decided to take Thomas on in a fight. But Tarnak was too cocky, and he even mentioned that he can kill Andre in a blink of an eye. Yet, he didn't realize that Thomas was prepared. The Monarch of Steel was surprised when Belion and Beru suddenly jumped out of Thomas's shadow. Tarnak then realized, it's a trap. It's a trap! Tarnak tried to call Antares, using his mind reading powers to warn him, but couldn't because Tusk had blocked his telepathy, cutting off his communication with Antares. Tarnak was so pissed because he was outplayed by Jin Wu. So the Monarch of Steel transformed himself into a monster and tried to beat Thomas, Belion, and Beru all on his own. But it didn't work out for him. Even just the two shadows were too strong for Tarnak. And they beat him up. And that proves that uh, the Monarch of Steel was not as strong as he really thought he was. Sure, he's tough, but Beru and Belion are on a whole another level. Tarnak just couldn't keep up because he's not the best when it comes to dealing damage. Even though we didn't get to see all of Leija's true power, I still think Tarnak is stronger. But if it turns out that the giant king Leija can actually mess with time, well that's a whole different storyline. Now, going back to chapter 152, there's a second person aside from Tarnak that refused when the Frost Monarch asked the other monarchs to help him kill Jin Wu. And that's Yogamut, the monarch of transfiguration and the king of demonic specters. The reason why he refused to help the Frost Monarch is because Yogamut doesn't want to end up like the Monarch of White Flames, which is Baran, the Demon King. And I'll explain the story in more detail later. So if Tarnak was kind of like a tank, then Yogamut was more like a mage. The only thing we know about his powers is that he can open portals. That's probably why he's called the Monarch of Transfiguration, because he can change or manipulate space. And actually, we saw this in action in chapter 173. In chapter 173, Yogamut tried to help Antares beat Jin Wu by opening lots of portals to bring in more dragon soldiers, but their plan didn't work. This was because Jin Wu's skill, Dragon's Fearsome Roar, rendered the dragon army useless. It immobilized every single dragon, including Yogamut. After that, no one knew where Yogamut went. I think maybe he died from emotional damage. I also think he's kind of like Tarnak. Yogamunt just supports other monarchs because he can't really deal damage by himself unless he summons a powerful monster or demonic specter to fight for him. So if you figure out a way to stop Yogamunt from summoning portals or if you immobilize him just like Jin Wu did, then he's pretty much out of the fight. Later when Jin Wu finally defeated Antares, he asked the rulers to use the Cup of Reincarnation one last time to turn back time. 
After that, Jinwu started to chase the monarchs in a place called the Dimensional Rift or Chaos World, where Jinwu finally found Yogamunt and definitely smashed. There were actually two monarchs who teamed up with the Frost Monarch to try and take down Jinwu. The first was Rakin, and the second was Kyoresha, the Queen of Insects, and the Monarch of Plagues. And guess what? Jinwu ended up fighting all three of them at the same time. So when you compare her up against the other three monarchs we talked about, Koresha is way stronger because she actually went toe to toe with Jinwu. At least she had courage. And that's the type of queen I need in my life. A courageous one, cause I'm scared of life. The insect queen launched her attack on Jinwu with an army of corpses, which she controlled using parasites. But during the fight, she got way too focused on trying to mess with Beru's mind. Big mistake. While she was distracted, Jinwu saw the opportunity. And my boy, <laughs> he took it. He snuck up behind her and slashed her face. Man, Kyoresha was absolutely furious. So she regenerated her entire body and tried to hit Jinwu with her poison. But here's the thing, our boy Jinwu is totally immune to poison. This just made Kyoresha even more enraged. <laughs> Sounds like my ex-girlfriend, you know what I'm saying? She charged at Jinwu, but he easily stopped her with the ruler's authority. Then with a swift move, he used his mutilation skill to slice her entire body into pieces. Now here's what I think about why Koresha is stronger than previous monarchs I mentioned earlier. If she will fight against Tarnak, it might be a tough fight because Tarnak is a tank, but if she continuously overwhelms this guy with her zombie army, then she could probably win. Or she can rain Tarnak down with her poison to wear down this armor. Fighting against Yogamunt is a difficult scenario because the Monarch of Transfiguration can easily summon monsters that can wipe out Kirisha's zombie army. Yet, if the Insect Queen can restrain Yogamunt, then there's nothing that he can do. If she fights against Lasia, it could be a tough battle because the Giant King, with his wits and strength, can totally flip the battle's outcome. Of course, he has giant armies, but I think the zombie apocalypse army might just overwhelm them because, you know, they don't die, sort of. Plus, if these giants die, she could also take control of them with her parasites. However, like I mentioned before, if Lasia can manipulate time, Kiraisha might struggle to combat the monarch of the beginning. But since we haven't seen the full might of these three, based on what we've seen in the manhwa, Kiraisha seems definitely stronger than the others. Next up is the Frost Monarch. But unlike the other monarchs, this guy doesn't even have a name. The Frost Monarch went to Korea and hunted down Chairman Go Gung Hee, one of the ruler's vessels, and managed to kill him. Side note, the rulers don't appear much in the story, but their human vessels did. Like Jin Wu since Ashbourne was a former ruler, Thomas Andre, Christopher Reed, and Jin Wu's dad, Sang Yel Huan. The Monarch of Frost is super tricky to fight because he's smart and uses everything to his advantage. I like guys like this, you know, working at full potential, not letting anything go to waste. Like this one time he was fighting Chairman Gun Hee, and just as Jin Wu showed up, the Frost Monarch quickly made a huge ice wall and threw an ice spear at Gun Hee just to distract Jin Wu, heartless. That quick thinking gave him just enough time to escape. He's a cold mofo, <laughs> literally. After seeing Jin Wu's power, the Frost Monarch realized that they could actually lose a war if Jin Wu was to go against them. That's why he met up with the other monarchs and asked for their help to quickly defeat Jin Wu before he realized his full power. Tarnak and Yogamunt were too scared and disagreed, but Rakin and Kuresha thought they could win since they believed Jin Wu wasn't at his strongest just yet. During the fight with Jin Wu, the Frost Monarch showed off his powerful abilities. As soon as Jin Wu summoned his shadows, the Frost Monarch instantly froze them with his icy breath. Now this guy needs trident. He could even create weapons out of ice and summon ice golems. So the Frost Monarch already showed two advantages against the other monarchs. One is that he can freeze an entire army. So even if you have giants or zombies, he can instantly stop them. Plus, aside from his army of ice elves, he can even create his own monsters, which are the ice golems. Meaning that the Frost Monarch can't be outnumbered. Plus, he can also create his own weapons. And he has an immense speed and strength that actually went toe to toe with Jin Wu in their second battle. When Jin Wu killed Kuresha, the Frost Monarch kept Jin Wu busy and Rakan sneakily attacked Jin Wu from behind, seriously hurting him. For a moment, it seemed like they had defeated Jin Wu, but that's what they thought, because Jin Wu has two hearts. And when his black heart started beating again, he came back to life. The monarchs tried to finish him off, but then Il Huan showed up. With a super strong kick, he sent them flying to a nearby building. Seeing that they were losing, Rakan decided to bail, leaving the Frost Monarch to fight Jin Wu by himself. Even though he was by himself, the Frost Monarch didn't give up. He created a giant ice storm that chopped off Il Huan's left arm. But just as he was about to beat Il Huan, Jin Wu returned back from the dead. 
The Frost Monarch, stubborn as ever, tried to fight Jin Wu, throwing his trident and casting ice magic, but nothing worked against Jin Wu. He broke the trident with just one hand and slashed the Frost Monarch across the chest. And that's how he finally avenged Chairman Gung He. The Monarch of Frost can absolutely handle the Monarchs, Tarnak, Yogamunt, and Koresha. Either he can overpower them with his powers, armies, and of course, with his strength or speed. But apart from that, I think he's just smarter than the others. Although, if he'll be fighting against the monarch, Rakan, then I don't think he can win. Now let's talk about the King of Beasts, the Monarch of Fangs, Rakan. When he showed up, rampaging through the city, Thomas Andre tried to stop him. Andre put up a great fight, but Rakan, in his full power, was too much for Thomas. So, imagine if the Frost Monarch fights against Rakan. Yes, the Frost Monarch is fast, and his ice magic is tricky. But remember, during Rakan's fight with Andre, Rakan wasn't using his full power. So if Rakan transforms into his true form, he could easily overpower the Frost Monarch for sure. Also, Thomas and Tarnak seem similar in their abilities. But of course, Tarnak, the Monarch of Steel, is stronger. However, if Tarnak and Rakan were to battle, Rakan's strength could easily break through Tarnak's tough armor. Even if Rakan were to fight against an army, he could handle it pretty well because he also has his own army. Plus, his true form is massive. He's so powerful, he could defeat an entire army by himself. And with his size, he could tackle giants as well. Just as Rakan was about to kill Andre, Leonard Neerman, an S-rank hunter from Germany, stepped in. But even Neerman stood no chance against Rakan, and nearly met his end. He was on the brink of defeat until one of Jin Wu's shadows intervened, stopping Rakan in his tracks. Moments later, Jin Wu appeared and delivered a crushing axe kick, smashing Rakan into the ground. A few chapters later, when Jin Wu came back to life, Rakan totally freaked out. Then Ilhuan showed up and kicked off a fierce fight with Rakan and the Frost Monarch. The moment the King of Beasts realized he couldn't stop Jin Wu, Rakan didn't waste a second. He dished the Frost Monarch and escaped through a portal. Damn, Rakan the chicken. He actually pulled that same stunt when he and the Demon King bought on betrayed Ashborn. Yeah, that's the only problem with Rakan. If he knows his enemy's stronger, the guy's gonna run away. So Rakan tried to hide himself, but he soon realized Jin Wu had followed him. Knowing he couldn't beat Jin Wu or escape, Rakan bowed his head and begged for forgiveness. Jin Wu agreed, but only if Rakan could withstand five of his attacks first. Realizing Jin Wu was mocking him, Rakan transformed into his ultimate form, ready to fight back with all his might. But Jin Wu defeated him easily. Now let's talk about the King of Demons and the Monarch of White Flames, Baran. But first let me show you what happened so you'll understand the Demon King's power. In Chapter 128, when the architect revealed the past to Jin Wu, he saw that right after Ashborn destroyed the ruler's soldiers, Baran and Rakan, leading their own armies, tried to attack the Shadow Monarch. But despite Baran's efforts, Ashborn defeated both him and the Monarch of Fangs. Rakan actually ran away from the fight, leaving the Demon King behind. Rakan is a big wussy, mate. Then Ashborn approached Baran and asked why he had turned against the Shadow Monarch. We didn't get a proper answer because, well, we all can't really speak demon. This made Ashborn so pissed that he ended up crushing Baran's skull with one hand. The demon king that Jin Wu fought in the demon castle is actually a copy of Baran, made by the architect, to be the final boss. Yet even as a copy, this guy was strong. I mean, he can summon many demons through portals, has lightning breath, and those hit by it instantly get stunned. That's why Jin Wu had a rough time with Bara too. But thanks to a distraction caused by Esil, Jin Wu managed to win. He ripped off Baran's left arm and smacked him hard in the jaw, which literally destroyed Baran's body. So, if the copy of the Demon King was this powerful, just imagine how overpowered the original Baran must have been. We didn't get a chance to see the full extent of this monarch's power, but his formidable strength might just be exactly why Antares ordered him and Rakan to betray Ashborn. Why? Probably because Rakan and Baran were on the same level of strength, making them the only monarchs who had a real shot at taking on the Shadow Monarch. Yet, there's still a chance that Baran was actually stronger than Rakan, because the moment Rakan saw Baran was defeated, he left him. So, if someone gets defeated, you wouldn't give up unless you think they were stronger than you and they got defeated. Next, Antares, the King of Dragons and the Monarch of Destruction. Antares finally came to the human world through a huge gate in Canada, my country? There he met J Mills, an S-rank hunter. When Antares saw that Jin Wu wasn't there, he used his fiery breath to turn Jay into ashes. Feeling pleased, Antares let his dragon army loose, destroying everything in their path. 
So, if Antares can easily kill you with just his breath and has an entire army of dragons backing him up, which of the other monarchs can stand against him? Except Ashworn, of course. Even if you have an army of giants, zombies, and demons, they won't stand a chance against the Dragon King. And let's not even count the ice golems, because they'll just instantly melt away. When Jinwoo finally showed up, he teleported Antares with him to a far-off island in Japan. The two started fighting there. Antares was tough to beat because he could turn into a dragon. At first, no matter how many times Jinwoo attacked, the Dragon King's scales were so thick that Jinwoo's attacks didn't even scratch Antares. This part literally shows that the Dragon King ain't just destructive, but he's also defensively strong. I mean, the guy's a tank. Tarnak must be jealous of this guy. Which means even if Baran had Thunder Breath, it'll only tickle Antares. If the Monarch of Frost uses his ice magic against this dragon, that magic will just be like a popsicle of ice cream that he can eat. And even Rakan can transform into a giant wolf, uh, but there's no chance he can bite through Antares' dragon scales. In short, they'll just die fighting Antares. So the Dragon King stopped fighting for a moment and offered not to harm all the humans if Jin Wu helped him defeat the rulers. But of course Jin Wu rejected this offer. This made them start fighting again. It was a tough battle. But when Jin Wu got a chance to use his dad's special dagger to nearly split Antares in two, Antares was really surprised to see that Jin Wu had actually managed to hurt him. Then he noticed the armies of the rulers up in the sky and realized Jin Wu had been planning this all along. Jin Wu also revealed that Antares is the one who ordered Rakan and Baran to attack Ashborn. After revealing that Antares was behind the betrayal, Jin Wu couldn't help but mock the Dragon King. His mockery taunted Antares, who then tried to attack Jin Wu one last time. However, the rulers jumped in and defeated him with their spears. Bro got fatalityed. Now with all of the monarchs totally defeated, Jin Wu had a special request. He asked the rulers to use the Cup of Reincarnation again to rewind time, aiming to bring back the many lives lost in the battle. The rulers agreed and turned back time. Boom! Antares and all the other monarchs were alive again. But there was a catch. The monarchs would still remember everything that had happened before. Which somehow wasn't really a big deal for our boy Jin Wu. He hunted down the monarchs and beat them all without much trouble. Fast forward 27 years. Antaras was the only monarch left. That's when Jin Wu showed up in his palace, ready to defeat him and finish everything. The Dragon King was really happy to get another chance to fight Jin Wu. In the end, Jin Wu won the battle. The only injury he got was a bad burn on his left hand. Next, the original Shadow Monarch and the King of the Dead, Ashborn. When the rulers captured Lasia, the Giant King, the balance of powers collapsed. Ashborn seized that chance to reach out to the other monarchs. In order to face off against the rulers, the monarchs had no choice but to team up with Ashborn. After that, Ashborn fought alongside the monarchs and became the Monarch of Shadows. Ashborn was so powerful, the rulers and even the monarchs feared him. That's why Antares ordered the Demon King and the King of Beasts to betray Ashborn. But these mofos didn't stand a chance against the Shadow Monarch. Since Jin Wu ended up killing all the monarchs, and since he and Ashborn are the same, then it's obvious that Ashborn is way stronger than all of the eight monarchs combined. Despite having massive, massive armies or crazy superpowers, Jin Wu is proof of how strong Ashborn really was. I mean, Jin Wu didn't even lift a finger against Tarnak. Jogament died without doing anything, while Rakan, Koresha, and the Frost Monarch, with their combined powers, were useless against Jin Wu. So Rakan ran away, and Baran ended up dying. After that, the rulers appeared, knelt before Ashborn, and asked for forgiveness. Bruh, the rulers could have easily killed Ashborn at that time, but instead they all kneeled and said sorry to him. Why? I think this is because they didn't just fear him, but they also respected Ashborn. Of course, Ashborn was furious and didn't want to forgive anybody. He even told them to end the war by killing him right there. But the rulers just kept asking for forgiveness. Ashburn was so confused and didn't know what to do. He then decided to hide in order to plan his revenge against the monarchs who betrayed him. So Ashburn left the big battle to strengthen his shadow army again. While he was hiding, the monarchs lost a huge amount of fighting power and were defeated by the rulers. See, that's how powerful Ashburn was. If the monarchs hadn't betrayed him, they couldn't have been defeated. By the way guys, the rulers and monarchs have spiritual bodies and don't have their own physical bodies. To visit the human world, they need to use human bodies. They pick people and use those bodies. But they let people stay in control of themselves. Rulers can't actually use their full power this way, unlike the monarchs who totally take over the human's body and use it for themselves. So both Ashborn and Antares possess enormous power. To cross into the world or earth, they need a human vessel that can handle such power. This is why Ashborn and Antares can't find a suitable vessel because they're just too overpowered. 
This is where the architect comes in. He offered to find Ashbourne a suitable human, and in exchange he asked for immortality. Ashbourne agreed with the architect and spent years searching for a suitable vessel. The architect actually had a tough time because no living being could become a vessel for death. That's when Ashbourne found Jin Wu. Jin Wu was chosen because he had stepped beyond the boundaries of the system that the architect had created. A human who didn't follow its rules and did things differently. Plus Jin Wu was always weak and constantly facing death, yet he always managed to escape with his life. Even though the architect disagreed, Ashbourne still chose Jin Wu. Then Jin Wu and Ashbourne became one. That's why Ashbourne said to Jin Wu, I am the record of your bitter struggle. I am the evidence of your resistance. I am the reward of your pain. I am death. I am eternal rest. And I am also terror. I am you. So after fully absorbing Ashbourne's powers, Jin Wu actually surpassed Ashbourne. With that kind of power, do you think Jin Wu could take on the strongest Isekai characters?